Okay, so let's just quickly recap what we uh, discussed yesterday. So um, we started by um, discussing how we can find the basis of a given family of Feynman integrals where this family is obtained by essentially promoting um, the propagators, which in quantum field theory would look like this. We promote them to have arbitrary integer powers. And this defines a family of Feynman integrals parameterized by uh, these integer exponents. Or equivalently, I can picture it as a lattice where at each point of this lattice sits an integral. And then the idea was to use the fact that in um, uh, dimensional, dimensional organizations, uh, all total derivatives must vanish. So that when my derivative acts on the propagators with these uh, arbitrary powers, differentiation essentially is going to shift the, these exponents so that they get uh, recursion relations for this family of integrals. And then we illustrated that on two examples. First, um, the massless bubble integral, where we showed well how you can explicitly solve the recursion in that case and end up with uh, something where you have a single so-called master integral, which is, I remind you that master integrals is just the physicist's word to, um, for, for a basis of the solution space of this recursion. And we also looked at uh, the example of the massless one loop box. And there, well, the equation is of course more complicated because now you have four propagators and it would of course hard to visualize because now you would be in um, a four dimensional space. Um, but there we used the Mathematica package Lightred, which allows you to, well, it doesn't directly solve the recursion, but it, uh, allows you to feed in a given Feynman integral, so for fixed values of these exponents, and it uh, reduces it down to a linear combination of mass integrals. And um, so that's what we did for the massless box, and that's where we're going to start from today. So let me just remind you uh, the definitions for the massless box. The massless box, well, it's, I guess you know what it is. You see the um, definition of the integral term this slide. You have four propagators, four external momenta. All external momenta are massless. And also um, momentum is conserved. So that in the end, I have three independent external momenta. I work in dimensional organization in four minus two epsilon dimensions. And by Lorentz invariance, my integral will only depend on the dot products be, uh, between external momenta which I denote as a J in the following, or I also denote them by S, T, and U, which are the standard um, two part of well, four particle Mandelstam sum invariants, which, as you guys know very well, sum up to zero in the massless case. So S plus T plus U is equal to zero. And then that's the last thing we did yesterday. We used Lightred to obtain the master integrals and I show you here the results. So, we found with light red that there are three master integrals, which were, well, the box integral itself, which you see at the bottom in red. So it's the box integral itself with unit power, so the propagators. And then there were two more, which were, had the, uh, the exponent 0, 1, 0, 1, which is the one in blue in the first line. And remember that a zero means that the propagator is absent. So it's like, pinching this edge in the graph. And I guess you can easily convince yourself if I uh, pinch two opposite sides of this box, I end up with just a two propagate integral, which is a bubble. And the other mass integral is the bubble, but just rotated by 90 degrees. It's like pinching the other two sides of uh, the edges of the other two edges of the box. So in the end, what you end up with is three master integrals. Two of them are bubbles, and one of them is a box. So now the question is, what are these integrals? So, so far, the problem we have solved is, if, I, if you take any 
Feynman integral with these four propagators, any one loop integral with these four propagators, will always be a linear combination of these three master intervals that are shown here, these two bubbles and this box. So you can put any powers for the propagators, you can put any numerator you like. If you have a one loop integral that has these precise four propagators, which are here, d1, d2, d3, d4, whatever numerator you put, whatever values for new you put, it will be um, a linear combination of these three objects. And this we can do with light red. But of course, in order to finish a calculation, you still need to know the values of these three master intervals. Now, yesterday we already discussed the bubble and I told that we didn't do the calculation of the bubble, but I told you it's very simple. You can go to your Q of T lecture. It's uh, essentially, well, you find a parameterize it as one integral to do and you get a couple of gamma functions. It's an easy integral. Um, I assume that uh, you've all seen the calculation of the bubble integral in your QFT classes. If not, we can go through it this afternoon and during the office hours if you like. So in the end, the only really new thing that we need is this box integral. And then of course, it's more complicated. So how can you do it? So, and this brings us to the main topic of the lecture, which are differential equations. So the goal is to obtain a set of differential equations, which is satisfied by my master integrals. That is the goal. And so how can I do that? Well, remember that yesterday we said that the key to IVP identities is that differentiation with respect to the loop momentum is, to some extent, well, morally equivalent to shifting these exponents new i. Okay, and that's what underlies uh, the IBP relations. Now, I guess it doesn't need a lot of uh, imagination to realize that I could also have differentiated propagators with respect to an external momentum, and it would still result in shifting the exponents. Okay, inside the propagators, if you just look at the integrand. I don't see the difference between what is loop momentum and what is external momentum. So differentiating with one or the other is uh, leads to the same effect. And it always leads to um, shifting the exponent. So therefore, the, the moral of the story is as follows. You start with a master integral. You differentiate with respect to an external momentum. Now, differentiating, of course, you now pull the derivative into the integral. You differentiate under the integral sign so that the derivative hits the propagators. But if the derivative acts on the propagators, that is equivalent by the same arguments as yesterday uh, 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 to, to shifting the exponents. So the derivative disappears. You just get a linear combination of integrals with shifted exponents. But from what you said yesterday, I can always write my integral with any values of the exponents using IVP identities as a linear combination of master integrals. So through this logic, you see that if you differentiate a master integral with respect to, well, let's say an external momentum for now, you always get back a linear combination of master integrals. Okay, and so in this way you can uh, obtain the differential equations for the integral. So that's the moral of the story. And now we're going to go into a bit more details. Is the moral clear? If not, uh, show it now before we discuss the details. Okay, good. So now the first thing that we want to fix is that, well, I said before I differentiate with respect to external momenta, that's fine. But we also said yesterday already that by Lorentz invariance, the integral is a function of the dot products, Sij, not of the individual piece. So I would rather write down the derivative with respect to the Sij's than with respect to the piece. But then it was the derivative with respect to the piece that allows me to shift the exponents because the integrand depends on the piece and not on the Sij's or rather the integrand depends on 
the SIJs, which are dot products between external momenta, but also um, dot products between external momentum and the loop momentum, which is not an SIJ. Okay. So we somehow have to build in this idea that on the one hand, we want to differentiate respect to P's, with respect to momenta, in order to get this idea of shifting exponents. But on the other hand, we want to differentiate respect to the dot products. That's the first issue. The second issue is that, well, if you look at the example of the massless box, and I will always illustrate everything in, on that example now, even if you manage to find what the derivatives are with respect to my invariants S12, S13, and S23, you have to somehow fold in that S12, S13, and S23, which is ST and U, they are not independent, but they sum up to zero. So because of this relation, you cannot just trivially, uh, for example, you cannot say that the derivative of S13 with respect to S12 is necessarily zero because they are related. Okay, so we also have to build that in. We have to build in these kinematic constraints. So, and finally, well, that is actually the easiest part, but still let me mention it. We said yesterday that um, in the end, I can always pull out one scale, which carries a dimension. And then the only non-trivial information is what's called here I, which depends on, so here's a typo, this should be S. The only non-trivial information is in the ratios of the invariance and here, well, for the master's box, you only have two independent ones, which is S and T. So the actual non-trivial functional dependence is in this variable X, which is T divided by S. So in the end, what we really want, we want the derivative of the box integral with respect to X. Because I want the derivative of, of this function I, oops. I want the derivative of that guy. Okay, so I want the derivative of the box, which is the object on the left hand side in red, with respect to x. And in order to do that, well, I want to use integration by parts, which, however, come from differential shifting the exponents, which are related to differential in respect to p's. So somehow I have to be able to express the derivative with respect to x in terms of derivatives with respect to external moment. And so we're going through that now step by step. Those who know the procedure, they may find that I'm a bit overly explicit and maybe a bit too baroque in my notations because I will make every single change of variable explicit. But I think it's good to do it with all notations and changes of variables explicit so that if you're not familiar with the procedure, you can actually see what's going on because otherwise it can be very, very confusing if all of a sudden you have well, it's, it's related to the fact that S plus T plus U is equal to zero, so that things are dependent on each other. So you have to be very careful at what you do when you do changes of variables. So we will indeed, in the end, just do a change of variables. So the idea is that you start from your box, which is a function of um, ex uh, external momenta, P1, P2, P3. P4 is just the sum of the other three, so I don't care about it. And the first change of variable that we want to do is we want to do a change of variable and then derive the corresponding differential operators using the chain rule. We want to do the change of variable from P1, P2, P3 to the Lorentz invariance S12, S23, S14. After that, we want to say, well, this function, which I call B, which depends on S12, S23, and S23, which appears to be a function of three variables is actually a function of two variables, which are called f, which just depends on s and t. And this f of s and t is actually related to b by saying that the third argument of b is minus s minus t. And in the last step, I want to say that this f is actually has a trivial dependence on one of the variables and it's only non-trivial in the ratio of S and T. So these two variables are still, there's some information. They are not as, uh, but the dependence on S and T is not completely arbitrary. 
So I want to do these three changes of variables and to each change of variable corresponds essentially an application of the chain rule to write the differential operators in one set of variable in terms of the differential operators in the other set of variables. So first step, I start from the differential operators that are natural Lorentz invariant operators that can act on the integrand. Which ones are they? Well, the integrand depends of course on the masses, the external masses, so derivatives with respect to masses. Or derivatives with respect to external momenta. And since I want Lorentz invariant differential operators, I contract them in a way such that uh, I get pi dot d over dpj. They are naturally Lorentz invariant and they are naturally ob differential operators that can act on the integrand. And note that if I act with such a differential operator, the act on the integrand and the result will always be a shift in the exponent. That holds for d over dp, but you can easily check that that also holds for the uh, derivatives with respect to masses. For example, let me act with the operator d33 on the box integral. Good. Well, I do it by acting on the integrand. And you can easily do the calculation. It's not very difficult. You differentiate with respect to P3. But the only propagator that depends on P3 is what is called D4. So that's why I get D4 squared. And of course, I need also to add um, the derivative of the propagator, which gives me a numerator. Now, we just use the same procedures what we did yesterday when we had numerators, k dot p3. I can write this again as um, uh, propagators, as inverse propagators. And so what you get is you get that um, uh, this relation holds. And I realized that I missed a term like this. Um, no, sorry, sorry, my bad, okay. So this relation holds. Um, you just write k dot p3 in terms of uh, d1, d2, d3, d4. So you see that acting with d33 just gives you back a linear combination of integrals but with shifted exponents. And mind you that the arguments are just um, the exponents. But every integral for any value of the exponents is a linear combination of master integrals. And I can reach that linear combination using IVPs. So I use example light red and light red will tell me that uh, the derivative the, the computed with D33 of the box integral is just a linear combination of a bubble which is here, and a box, which is here. Okay, and then there's a factor in front, which depends on the space time dimension d, and also on the kinematic variables, s, t, and so on. Okay, now this is just working out the derivative in the integrand, and I use the IVP relations that we have to express the result back into the Good. Now, the next step will be that here I have derivative with respect to, well, P3, the external momentum P3. I remind you the goal is to get derivative with respect to X. Before we do that, let's, well, let, let's open the parenthesis. Let's make a little comment, which is so very important. So I have these differential operators, which are called here Dij. Um, you can count how many there are. There are obviously, well, there's D11, D12, D13, D21, D22, D23, D31, D32, D33, so nine operators. And in this case, I don't care about the uh, derivatives back to the external masses because I'm looking at the masses box. So I have nine differential operators. 
I guess it doesn't need a lot of uh, thinking to realize that they cannot all be independent because in the end, your, your integral will only depend on S and T, on two variables. You have two degrees of freedom, but you have nine differential operators. So they cannot all be independent. So one relation between these operators is actually always present and you can always obtain it. Namely, it goes as follows. Um, if you take the sum of all the, so this is DII. The sum of all the DIIs plus the sum of all the derivatives respect to the masses, weighted by the mass, what you get is just on the other side, you get back the integral itself multiplied by a number, which is just the dimension of the integral. Now, why is that? It's actually very easy to see that that must hold. Well, it has to do with the fact that this particular differential operator that I wrote down here is nothing but the infinitesimal generator of the dilatations of, well, you scale a quantity by its dimension, by well, So you scale every dimensional quantity by lambda, or by lambda to its energy dimension to be more, more specific. So it's actually the generator of dilatations. And well, what is, are the eigenvalues of that uh, operator? Well, it's the dimensions. If, if it's not clear, we can also go through the derivation. It's actually very easy to see. You can think about it for a bit, but there's always this what I call the scaling relation, which tells you that if you add up all the DAIs and all the mass, they with respect to all the masses, you get back the integral itself with the specific number which you can predict, which is just the energy dimension of the integral. So on the one hand, this doesn't have a lot of information. It tells you that there's this combination which does not contain a lot of information. On the other hand, it's a very useful check for your computations because it tells you if you compute all the DAIs and all the derivatives respect to the masses, each derivative itself will be a complicated beast. But if you sum them up, you must get this very simple object on the right-hand side. So it's a very nice way of checking that you have the, nine, the correct differential equations. Okay. Okay. So then let's move on. So we have now derivatives with respect to external momenta, but we said, well, actually my box is a function which I call B of just the dot products between external momenta. So it's a function of S12, S23, S13. So what I want to do is I want to write all my differential operators dij in terms of the differential operators with respect to s12, s23, s13, with respect to all the dot products. And I know how to do that. It's very easy. We just use the chain rule, okay? I show it here explicitly for d12. It's very easy. d12 is, well, it's one. So it's p1 mu outside. And then you have P2 mu, and then you just use the chain rule to get the derivatives respect to S12, S23, S13, and you can easily uh, see, well, S13, the, um, the derivative of S13 by, uh, by P2 is zero, and where is, Sorry, I think I'm, ah, yeah. The first one here is not zero, but this is proportional to P1 mu. So when you contract with the P1 that is outside, you also get zero because P1 squared is zero. So the only term that survives is the third one, which is the derivative with respect to S23. And there you have this is proportional to P3 mu. And so when you contract with P1, you get S13. So you just use the chain rule to write down this relation. So you can write every dij in terms of the 
um, derivatives back to SIJs. And there you explicitly see that there are many relations among them because you have only three derivatives with respect to SIJs, but nine DIJs. So what you can do is that you can invert these relations. So you pick a subset, you invert them, so that you can write now the derivatives with respect to the SIJs in terms of the DIJs. And I show you here the result. It's very easy to do. This is uh, what you get. You can easily check that these relations hold. You work out what all the DIJs are. You can see that these relations hold. Let me, um, well, and what you should notice is that if you add up the three operators with respect to the SIJs, you just get back again this dilatation operator because now the only dimensional quantity that you have is S12, S23, and S13. So if you scale them, that is what gives you the dimension up to a factor one half because the SIJs have an energy dimension squared. So you get twice as much. So you have to divide by two to get the same eigenvalue as before. Okay, so that's another, that shows you how you can use this check of the scaling relation to check your differential operators because at every step, you must have so these relations that are satisfied. We will also see that later, how that works in mathematics. Okay, so that was the next step. So now comes actually the most tricky step, which needs a bit of being careful. And that's why I'm so picky about notations. So my function, which are called B, let's go back. So B was a function of uh, the three dot products that I have. But my three dot products are not independent because S plus T plus U is equal to zero. So actually I'm having a function of two variables, S and T, which I obtain from B by putting U to be equal to minus S minus T. So it's like, yeah, you're in the three dimensional space, S, T and U, but you're actually, you're constrained to lie on the surface where S plus T plus U is equal to zero. And what does that mean? Well, it means that the derivative with respect to S, so let's go, maybe you could even do a poll. So you have, on the one hand, you have this, you have these two, these three, sorry. And you know that S is equal to S12 and T is equal to S23. So you would, I think from this, you would say, ah, well, that means that this one is equal to that one. And this one is equal to that one because T is S23 and S is S12, but that is wrong. Why? Because S plus T plus S13 is equal to zero. So S13 is not independent from, uh, from S and T. If you change S, you may, uh, if you change S keeping T fixed, you actually change S13. Because you have, you're, you're bound to move on this surface where S plus T plus U is equal to zero. Okay. I want to, to highlight this because this is something that often causes confusion that people just plug in S is equal to S12. And so the derivative with respect to S must be equal to, to the derivative with respect to S12. No. If you have a constraint, that is not true. Let's see it explicitly. So that's why I'm so picky about the notations here and about these changes of variables. The derivative with respect to S of my function F, well, F we said is equal to B where I put U equal to minus S minus T is this. But this now has two terms. It has one term where I act here on the first variable and it has another term where I act on the third variable. And the same for the derivative with respect to T. There's a term where I act now on 
the second variable and there's a term we act on the third variable. And to check that everything is consistent, you can again check the scaling relation because if I say I have a function that only depends on S and T, well, then my scaling relation, right, whoops, sorry, my dilatation operator is this one. But on the previous page, we had also said that D also has a contribution from DS13. And you can check that if you take this and you plug in what is D over DS and D over DT in terms of DS12, DS23, DS13, uh, you get this. So that's all consistent. It's a one line calculation. You can easily check it if you plug in all the changes of variables, everything is consistent. Again, it shows you that checking the scaling relations can be a very powerful check to make sure that you did the right thing. And last but not least, and again, I'm overly picky here because of uh, the fact that one has to be very careful how one interprets it. Your function f, which depends on s and t, is actually has a trivial dependence on s, which I call your sigma because I want to work with minus s, that's a material. And the function is only on the respect to x. So we want to have ddx. So again, you have to be careful because you would be, well, it's tempting to say, well, you see, I just traded, well, I have dd sigma, but sigma is equal to minus s, so sigma is equal to that. That is incorrect. Sigma is not the relative respect to s, even though sigma is s. Instead, if you do the chain rule carefully and you do all the changes of variable carefully, you see that, well, ddx, you do the chain rule, it's derivative with respect to t. That's clear because, well, t is only a function of x. Sorry, x and t, well, I can swap them one for the other. But if you compute dd sigma, you actually get the contribution from dds and ddt. Now, here, what is the scaling relation? Well, yeah, the only dimensional quantity is sigma because x is dimensionless. And you can check that with this definition of dd sigma that is here in pink, if you take that, you plug it in here, indeed you recover what is down here, which involves dd sig dds and ddt. So that's another way to see that dds it's not dd sigma, even though s is equal to sigma. It sounds a bit counterintuitive, but it, if you think about it mathematically, it comes from the fact you're in a two dimensional space, which is, has coordinates s and t, and you change coordinates to sigma and x. But the Jacobian, if you want, has a non diagonal entry. Okay. So if you follow these steps, and I invite you to do it uh, calmly after the lecture, well, you will do it because it will be part of the team project. Uh, you manage to get in the end ddx in terms of ddt, ddt in terms of derivative respect to s23 and s13, and derivative respect to S13 and S23 in terms of the DIJs. And with the DIJs, you can act on the integrand, and they act just by shifting the exponents. So that is what we wanted to achieve. Okay. So that is what I, what I just said. And in the end, what it means if you take your vector i, which is the vector of mass integral, so i here is um, 
this vector that has my three masses. There were the two bubbles and the box. And you differentiate them, you get back on the other side, the linear combinations of bubbles and boxes, which is what is expressed in this line. And there's a matrix which will depend on my variable X and epsilon. And let's say I put in here, sigma, I put it to one because it's just an overall pattern. Is that clear how you can obtain the differential equations? Now is the right time to ask questions. And then after that, we will see how this works in Mathematica. Any questions? No? Good. So then let me share my screen. So this is the same Mathematica notebook that we had yesterday where we ended up uh, being able to use light red to IBP reduce, meaning meaning find the decomposition into, into mass integrals of some integral, which was, I gave it the name, which was massless box or massless just publication with exponents two, three, one, one is in a combination of my three masters. There's the one with one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, and the box with one, one, one. Okay. So that is where we were yesterday. So now let's move on to the differential equations. Actually, light red can compute the derivatives for you. In fact, it can compute for you the derivatives with respect to the SIJs directly. For example, where well, there's this command d inf, derivatives with respect to an invariant of the integral, well, one, 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 which is the box with respect to pi dot pj. Let's execute it. So this is derivative of the box with respect to uh, p1 dot p2. And you see what you get is a linear combination of j's or so integrals or shifted values of the news. And I can of course go and you can say, well, let, now let's go and IBP reduce it because each of these integrals is just a linear combination of masters. And there it is. So I just act with the function IBP reduce on the previous output. And now I get a linear combination of masses. So I see now that the derivative of the massless box with respect to P1 to P2 is a sum of the massless box and of one of the two bubble integrals. And I can do that for all three differential operators, ds12, ds23, ds13. So I just, change here, well, and I do it on the list of masters. This is a command we had yesterday briefly. So that is just the set of master integrals. For this vector of master integrals, I compute for each of them, the derivative respect to the invariant S12, S23, S13, and I IBP reduce it. And note, I include a factor one half because the derivative here is respect to P1 dot P2, but my SIJ was two times P1 dot P2. Okay, and then there's this collect function which just collects the coefficients in front of each master integral in, in front of each object J. If you're not so sure what this means, it's not important for the following, we can go through that in the, in the office hours. It's just massaging of the expressions. So let's write down what the three derivatives are. And let's look at them. For example, ds12 of the first master is apparently zero. Does that make sense? Well, if you look at what the first master was, which was this 0, 0101, 0, 1, it was the bubble integral in the, in the t channel. So it doesn't depend on s. So indeed, that gives me zero. The second master integral was the bubble with respect to 
in the S channel, it only depends on S. It depends, so and if it depends on just one scale, it must be the scale to some power times a number. So and the derivative of S to some power is gives me back the same object, okay? The derivative of X to the alpha is proportional to X to the alpha divided by X. And this is the derivative of the box that were before. And I can do the same for the derivative with respect to S12. And now, of course, the first bubble in the T channel is non zero, the bubble in the S channel vanishes. While the, uh, the box gives me well, something that looks very similar to what we had before. And there's also the derivative with respect to U, with respect to S13. And there, well, both bubbles vanish because none of the bubbles depends on S13, but I get something non zero for the box. And I can verify that this makes sense by checking the scaling relation. So if I take S12, and I remind you, SP means P1 to P2, so I have to multiply by two, times the derivative of respect to S12. S23 times the derivative with respect to S23, S13 times the derivative with respect to S13. That, as expected, gives me just back the list of master integrals. I tell, let's compare. You see that you get back, if you add up the three derivatives, this is the correct factor. You get just back the same integrals multiplied by a factor, which is precisely the energy dimension of the integral. Okay. Good. So those are the derivatives with respect to SIJs. So now let's change variables from the SIJs to S and T. And I remind you that the chain rule tells you this. S is equal to S12, but the derivative respect to S is a linear combination of the derivative respect to S12 and S13. So the derivative respect to S is, well, the derivative respect to S12 minus the derivative respect to S13, and the same for T, and that is what it is. Now I can check again the scaling relation, S ddS plus T ddT, I get back the same thing. Well, the same thing as before for the scaling relation. And finally, I can act, well, I can change variables to x, and let me be really picky and also put this sigma, that would just s up to a sign. Can discuss the sign in the office hours if you want this convention. And there the chain rule tells me that derivatives with respect to sigma and x are related to dds and ddt in this way. So dd sigma, is related to DDS and DDT in this way. And now, well, that is just a scaling relation because sigma is the only dimensional quantity. So it's just sigma to a power, which is the energy dimension of the integral times the dimensionless quantity. While DDX, that is where the non-trivial information is, the with respect to uh, X looks like this. And I can combine all this into a matrix. So I remember, so I have these vectors. I have my, well, I have the vector of master integrals, two, three master integrals. And so I can combine the information about the differential equation in the matrix, okay? So this is the matrix that when it acts on this vector, gives me the derivative of that vector with respect to x. Okay. Any questions? And it's always, I know it's always hard to follow code on the screen. I will make the notebook available so you can look at it calmly and uh, uh, play with the different functions, which uh, you will actually need for the Teams project. 
but are there any questions right now? I have a question. Yeah. Um, there is a counting argument to understand how many master integrals there are. I, I imagine that to loops the situation, it is uh, more difficult. There are much more than three. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are much more than three. I mean, we're talking, if you do complicated calculation, it may be 500 or 1,000. Okay, so that is why it's important to have these automated codes that uh, you don't care too much about how many there are. Because you see, I never used here, well, so there is this vector of master, in let's go back here. There's the vector of master integrals and they act on this vector. I don't care too much about how long this vector is. So, because I have a code behind that allows me to do it in an automated way. Now, regarding your question about how many integrals there are, or how many masters there are, uh, it's hard to predict. So there are methods to um, get the number, but they are not easy. There is a code also that does it. It's called mint. However, there can be uh, issues even just predicting the number. The reason has to do precisely with um, ideas, uh, things like constraints, S plus T plus U equals zero, P one square equals zero, P two square equals zero. So that some of these methods even, well, they actually would predict more masters than they actually are because there are certain constraints which would force some of the masters to vanish or to be reducible. So the answer is yes, there are methods to predict the number of masters, but they are complicated and they are not bulletproof. They are more like upper bounds. Thank you. More questions? Robert put a question in the chat. Okay. Mm. Ah, so you say, why do you have uh, put sigma to one? Well, you see, well, let me stop this screen here and go back to the... So let me share again the other screen. So why have we put sigma to one? It's just out of convenience because remember that in the end, my integral looks like sigma to some power, which I can predict It's the energy dimension of the integral times a function i of x. So the only thing that I care about is i of x. So I can just decide to put sigma equal to one because I know that it depends on sigma in any case. So it's just easier because I can reduce the number of variables. I don't want to carry sigma around. Okay, good. Okay, so I see that that seems to answer the question. Okay, good. Francesco? Yes, hello. Sorry, a very uh, quick uh, question. Uh, just yeah. uh, on the, uh, or I mean, I don't know how involved the, the, the actual answer would be. So, but I just ask uh, maybe it may be a simple answer. So, on the, on, the, on the matrix that you get in the system, when you have the matrix A, yeah. Uh, depending on on these x and, and epsilon, uh, these two variables, uh, is the is the are the epsilon x x's contribution um, somehow can kind of be separated, or is the is the relation like arbitrarily complex the interplay between the x and the epsilon? Yeah, that's a very complicated question. So okay. what you, we can definitely say is that. Um, uh, it will always be rational functions okay. of x and epsilon. Why? Well, because the integrand is a rational function and you obtain it by computing derivatives of rational functions, which are again rational functions. Right. So that, that for sure. Now, the other thing is that um, in general, you expect, and I say expect, that the dependence on epsilon and x factorizes in the sense that you don't have denominators of the type x minus epsilon. The yeah. poles in epsilon should not depend on x and vice versa. Yeah. 
However, even that is a bit of, um, depending on how you do it, you may end up with these things. So the statement is more like, there is a good choice of master integral such that it, this doesn't happen. Okay. Um, but if you just, well, not for these simple examples like the one who box, but for complicated things, depending on how you run the IBPs, you may end up with poles in X that depend on epsilon and vice versa. But then you could find a different basis, a different set of masters where this goes. This doesn't happen. There are also uh, codes that take care of that. At this point, I don't think that there's much more you can say about the dependence of the matrix on X and epsilon. That is a very important question that will come now. But at this point, we don't have much more than that the dependence is a rational function and the dependence is, um, say, factorized in the sense that there are no poles that mix X and epsilon. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think I have to push screen share again. Good. So now, before we, we go on. Sorry, Claude, we don't see your screen share. Mm -hmm. It popped up briefly and then disappeared again. Good. So uh, before we move on, just a word about how all this generalizes to uh, more complicated functions where you have more than just this one X, but of course in practice you have more scales, so you have more than one X, you have X1, X2, X3 and so on. So and then in general, your matrix will be a matrix that depends on, um, uh, on all of these axes. And of course you could now compute by exactly the same methods and is a derivative with respect to each of these axes. And it is convenient just to combine them into a total differential. And your matrix will then be a matrix of one forms. If you don't know what a one form is, it's not too important. It's an object of the type dx. So that, that is a differential. And so what are the properties of that matrix? Well, the first property is precisely the one that was already discussed now, which is that the entries of that matrix as obtained by IBPs, they're always a rational function of the XI and epsilon. They're not arbitrarily complicated, they are rational. At least at this stage. So when you run the IBPs, you get a rational function. Then there's an important property which is the following. So I guess you know from analysis that d square must always be zero. Total derivatives is always squares to zero. Now, of course, I know what that is. I can say, well, this is d of di, but di, so my differential equation is di equals ai, okay? So I can plug in what di is, I can use the Leibniz rule, so act on A and then act on I. And now here I can act on, I, here I can inject the differential equation again. So I actually get da acting on I and then A squared acting on I. Or if you're more familiar with differential forms, actually A wedge A, but um, it's a uh, thing of it as a product to this wedge if you don't know what the wedge is. And from there you get that this matrix A must satisfy a constraint, namely that the derivative of A is equal to A wedge A. So that is a strong constraint on what A is. And if you see this, this looks a bit like uh, a gauge connection, right? A trivial one because it's zero. Well, rather, this is the field strength, okay? So if A was a, a gauge connection, this was a field strength tensor. F is dA minus A wedge A. Or 
say, forgetting overall factors, coupling constants, kind of things. This is just more like a side comment, but it's not just a side comment because the other property that you have is I can, of course, change my basis of masters. So I could start with my masters, I, and I could choose a different set, a different basis, J. And there's, of course, there's a matrix a rotation that brings you from I to J. So I can ask, okay, what does differential equation become when I write in terms of the basis J? Well, again, I use the Leibniz rule. So I say that this is um, derivative expecting on M, uh, acting on M to act, uh, times J and M times derivative of J. But on the other hand, I know that the derivative of I is A times I. But I is M times J. So from there, I get what DJ is. So DJ satisfies the differential equation of the same type with the new matrix A prime, which is related to the original one in this way. And you see that actually A prime looks very much like a gauge transformation. This is how the gauge field would transform. So this thing is actually, if you want, um, I'm saying this because it will explain some of the features of these things that come later. A is a gauge connection, or rather D minus A if you want is a covariant derivative. A is a gauge connection. It's a trivial one because the curvature vanishes. The curvature vanishes, so this is what it says here. And well, if you change basis, that corresponds to a gauge transformation on the gauge field. That's a way to memorize some of the um, the properties. But mathematically, it is the same as gauge theory. Okay, so those are the properties that we can state on general grounds about the differential equation and the matrix A, which essentially encodes the differential equation. So now I have to solve it. And you can imagine to do that in general can be very, very tough. So that's not an easy task. Huh? Um, it depends very much on the, the matrix A. Now, at this point, we have to remember that we want to compute integrals in dimensional regularization, which means we just want to compute the first few coefficients in the epsilon expansion. We don't care about the full dependence on epsilon. We just care about the first few terms. So the idea is that it's actually easier to compute the coefficients in the Laurent expansion than it is to compute the full functional dependence. And we're going to exploit that. And we're going to use it in the following way. Imagine I find a gauge transformation such that in this new basis, my matrix A prime, which depends on my X and epsilon, now has the following very special form. It depends on, there's a matrix which depends on the axis and epsilon is just a linear factor that sits in front. Imagine you find such a gauge transformation. Now, what happens? Well, if I do that, then my new system takes this form, okay? J would be the new set of master integrals which I get from this chain of basis from this gauge transformation. And it has this very special form that epsilon now enters in this very special way. This probably connects to the question that was asked before. So can you say something more about the dependence on epsilon and x? Well, yes, but at least here, I assume that I can find another basis where there is a very special dependence on epsilon. It's something that was introduced by Johannes Sen in 2013, and it's often called the canonical form of the differential equation. So why is it useful? So imagine I found such a transformation. I found a gauge transformation 
a change of basis such that my differential equation has this very special form where epsilon is factorized. So what is the solution? So now I can write down the solution. At least I can write down the formal solution. The formal solution goes as follows. It is a path ordered exponential. Um, of, so let, let me draw a picture. It's maybe clearer. Imagine you know the value of the integral at some point x0, which I choose as my initial condition. And imagine you want to compute it at the point x. So how can you do that? Well, choose a path that goes from x to x0 to x, call it gamma. And now what I want to do is the following. So it is a bit like, mm, so here you have your vector of masters, j, i, at point x zero. And what I want to do is I want to do parallel transfer to the point x. That's the geometric meaning. Now, of course you could say, well, how can you be sure that parallel, to, I mean, if I choose this path or that path, I would get a different answer. So what is the value at the point X? Well, what is the condition that parallel transport doesn't depend on the path? Well, it's the condition that the space is flat, right? If you're in a flat space, then choose any path you like. You can move along any path you like, parallel transport will always result in the same thing. So is my space flat? Yes, it is, because that was precisely where we said about the integrability condition, the curvature must vanish. So parallel transport doesn't really depend, doesn't depend on the path. Just depends on the starting point and the end point. And if you write down the formula for parallel transport, that is what it looks like. So this is this guy here, if you, you stay with the analogy of gauge theories, this thing is like a, like a Wilson line along this path. But I just say path from X not to X because in the end, the details of the path don't matter. It's just the beginning and the end point. Epsilon you see looks a bit like the coupling and uh, my matrix A till looks neat like the gauge field. And then I have here the initial condition at the point X. So you can really think of this thing as a parallel transport. The path ordered exponential is a, a Wilson line. Oh. Wilson computed along the path that goes from the initial condition to the final point. And well, you can also check it explicitly. If you plug this solution in here, you will see that it is actually satisfied. You can use do that as an exercise. If you take this expression, you plug it in the differential equation in green, you see that it is satisfied. But the geometric meaning is really the one of parallel transport. You, you know that at one point and you, you parallel transport your vector of master integrals to the next point. And it, you don't depend on the path because the space is flat if integrability, if, if the integrability condition is satisfied. Okay, fine. So that's all fine and nice, but why, what have I gained? So where does this canonical form come in? So why was this special choice of gauge, if you want, important? To do that, let's look at, to set aside, let's look at an example. Um, so let's assume that A tilde has this form shown here. That is, by the way, the form that you get for the uh, master's box integral. We'll see that uh, in a bit. And so let's go and compute this, um, this path ordered exponential. But remember that we don't care about the full dependence on epsilon. We just care about the Laurent expansion in epsilon around epsilon equals zero. So it's enough just to expand the exponential and to truncate it at some point. 
So let's do that. So let's take the path of an exponential. Well, at leading order in epsilon is just the identity because we've, yeah, the exponential is one. At the next order, I just get the exponent. At the next order, well, I have now, now I have to take into account that my, I have a path ordering. So um, the integration variables are ordered in the same way as the matrices. So the next order, I get this expression. And what you see is that if I want to, for example, imagine I want to compute up to order epsilon square. I want to first three terms in the epsilon expansion. I just stop here. And so if I manage to do these integrals, then that is the solution for the Laurent coefficients. And you can easily see here, do it. For example, whoops. You can easily see this integral here is just a log. So is this one. This integral here would be log square. The others, um, and also the last one is log square. The others are a bit more complicated. And we'll see that in the third lecture. But I guess you can see at least in this way, you can obtain a representation easily for the expansion in epsilon by truncating this path order exponential in the right way. And then you have to do these integrals that are left which are called iterated integrals. Iterated because, uh, because of the path ordering, because you see they are always such that the outermost integral goes from the initial point to the end point. The next integral just goes from the initial point to the variable that you have in the previous integration. So they are ordered along the path. That's where the path ordering comes from. And these integrals are called iterated integrals. Well, discuss those in, in more detail in the next lecture. So for now, let's just uh, stay with it like this. Mm -hmm. You have a way to write down this, if you want, almost a bit formal solution for the, um, uh, uh, the path order. Also note that this path order exponential is a matrix because A0 and A1 are matrices. A tilde is a matrix, A0, A1 are matrices. So the path order exponential this matrix is uh, well, this, the path of exponential is a matrix which acts on the vector. So this thing here is a matrix which acts on the vector evaluated at one point to obtain the value of i at the point x. Okay. Quick questions here about this. No, good. There is a question in the chat. Would you like to uh, unmute yourself to ask it, Sengwan? Uh, I can read it, so it's fine. Um, so does it allow tilde of non logarithmic singularities? Uh, let's postpone this uh, discussion for now. So far, I've not said anything about what the singularity structure of these things is. The example that I discussed here indeed has logarithmic singularities. And that is in general what you expect. But it can be a bit more complicated than that. I deliberately did not go into that discussion yet. We, um, we may go a bit into that in the next lecture. But to understand the master's box for now, it's not so important. More important is the question. So I said, assume that you find this gauge transformation such that you get to this canonical form. That is not very helpful because I have not told you how to find it, nor did I tell you, well, did I answer the question, does it even exist? Maybe such a thing doesn't even exist. Now, conjecturally, at least it does exist. And actually the statement is a bit weaker. The statement is that there is a gauge transformation or change of basis mu. 
So this is, I remind you, I start from I and I want to find a new basis with mass intervals J and M is the rotation between them. So there is a transformation matrix M whose entries are algebraic. Remember that we said at the beginning when you run the IVPs, this matrix A is the matrix of rational functions. Now I say there's a matrix M that is algebraic, it contains algebraic functions, such that after this transformation, the new matrix A prime, oops, is linear in epsilon. But there is an A1. This is not quite what we had before. There is an A1. And in general, this A1 will be there. There's even, for those who are interested, there's a slightly stronger conjecture by Roman Lee, which says that you can actually make essentially A1 equal to A2. So it would be in general, not be epsilon times the matrix by epsilon or epsilon plus one half, but the matrix would be the same. So the claim is there's always a gauge transformation, a change of basis that is algebraic, not rational, such that you can make the matrix linear in epsilon. Now, in many interesting cases, which actually the cases, pretty much the only cases we know how to solve, A1 comes out to be zero. In general, it's not, and I insist on that. In general, A1 will not be zero. You will not find an algebraic transformation that makes A1 zero. We may, so, but in many interesting cases, you do find that A1 is zero. And there are codes that allow you to find it. Um, I should however point out that it's not, so these codes can find a solution to the problem, but it does not necessarily mean that if the codes don't find a canonical form that it doesn't exist, okay? They are more like sufficient conditions. So if they find something, then you have it. If you don't find the solution, then try another code. Good. Uh, so for now, we will now go back to the massless box where A1 will turn out to be zero. And that's what we will restrict ourselves to. That's pretty much the case that is understood. The case where A1 is non-zero is more complicated, much more complicated. And we'll probably comment a bit on it in the lecture next week. But for now, let's assume that I find a canonical form where A1 is zero. And we'll now go back to um, the master's box and illustrate all these uh, things there in Mathematica. But the last comment I want to make is about the initial condition. Yes, we've now talked a lot about how to find uh, this path ordered exponential that um, allows me to do parallel transport, but I still need to find the value at one point. And that can be very tough. And we're not going to discuss that here because that can be, well, that can sometimes be even the hardest part of the problem or one of the hardest parts. If you want, so this one for the master's box, for example, that would mean that you would somehow manage to get the value at, of the master's box at S equals zero. And then you could start from there, something like that. That can be very difficult. Another approach, which is often more promising, is to say, well, actually, I know more about these integrals. These integrals must be Feynman integrals, which have a certain set of properties which come from physics, for example, unitarity. For example, unitarity tells you that the discontinuities of an amplitude are related to the cuts. So I know precisely where the discontinuities are. It will turn out that in many cases, the differential equation will have singularities in other places, not just at the places where unitarity tells you that you should have a branch cut, but there would be other singularities. And that means that the general solution to the differential equation would have singularities or branch cuts in all these places where you have a singularity in the differential equation. But the Feynman integral, the specific solution you're looking for doesn't have them. 
because they're the only singularities and only branch points are those coming from unitarity. And you can use that to constrain the solution. For example, for the massless box, we know that uh, this is continuity in the S channel is the cut in the S channel, this continuity in the T channel is the cut in the T channel, but there is no discontinuity in the U channel for the massless box. As we will see, the general solution will have a discontinuity in the U channel. And so the initial condition will be to require that the special solution we're looking for is one that satisfies physical constraints, in particular that there's no discontinuity in the U channel. So that's another way of fixing the initial conditions by, uh, by starting from the general solution. The general solution is actually this, this matrix, the path ordered exponential. And you require that this particular solution you're looking for has the correct properties. And so we have 10 minutes left. That's just about enough to go to um, uh, the example. So can you see the screen? Yes, we yeah. can. Good. So. This is the matrix A that we found. And well, you can, can even, so remember D is four minus two epsilon. So you see this is indeed a matrix that is rational in X and epsilon. And you see actually here, this is already linear in epsilon even. But here we can even do better. So let me, so this is the formula. If I do a rotation by matrix M of my basis of masters, I have the matrix of differential equation A, the variable is X, then A transforms like a gauge connection. And let me do the following rotation. I just pull it out of my head now. As I said, in practice, for example, you could use one of these codes, Libra, Fuchsia, to find this matrix. So now let me compute what you, I start from the matrix that we found, these four minus two epsilon, and I do this rotation M, and now I get this. And now you see that indeed everything is proportional to epsilon. So this is indeed a matrix that has the form epsilon times a matrix that doesn't depend on epsilon. And let me, this is just a help of function. So I just pulled out epsilon and I want to give myself the opportunity to name the variables in some way, because now I will have to, to put this in, in, in the formula for the path ordered exponential. So I have to integrate over these variables. I want to name them x1, x2 and so on. And that is just the same as this matrix here. So epsilon times this matrix is the same as this. So let's start. So let's compute the path ordered exponential. Leading order in epsilon, it's just the identity. At linear order in epsilon, well, I should take just the matrix itself and I have to integrate it. I hope you remember the formula for the path ordered exponential is in the exponent sits the in epsilon times the integral of A so to linear order in epsilon is just the integral of A. Note that I integrate, I just compute here primitive. So I don't put integral form two. The reason being that I'm looking for the general solution. So the initial condition, I don't care about it too much at this point. So I just want something that satisfies the differential equation. So it's the integral of A and Mathematica immediately tells me it's a bunch of logs. I can do the same at order epsilon square. Now I have to multiply two of these matrices. Let's look at it first. So I multiply two of these matrices, but I call the arguments x1 and x2 because I have to integrate over x1 and x2 in that order. So I can first integrate over x2. Again, I just don't care about the integration boundaries because that's my choice of initial condition. 
So integrate out x2. So now everything depends. So I integrate up to x1. I get logs, but I still have x1s. I also integrate out x1. So I get log squares. But I also get other things like these dialogues. We will see them in a bit more detail next week. I can do the same now, third order in epsilon. So now I have to start with the triple product of matrices and then I integrate out the variables one at a time. And so my general solution is the sum, well, the general solution up to order epsilon cube is the sum of all of these guys. So that's a big matrix. See, it's a big matrix, which actually satisfies the differential equation at least up to order epsilon cube. Because I've only solved the part of the exponential to order epsilon cube. So I can only expect my differential equation to be satisfied up to that order. Okay. So that is the general solution up to that order. So it's matrix, which acts on a vector of initial conditions. So how can we fix initial condition? Well, Remember there were bubbles. Bubbles, we computed them already. You can look at the formula that I gave you and it looks, well, looks like this. There's P square, and then there's this C gamma, which is this combination of gamma functions, and there was this prefect. C gamma. So, so for the bubbles, well, essentially, you can easily convince yourself that the initial condition is just. So if you check it, that is the kinematic variable. And actually there should be power. Minus epsilon, yep. That is the kinematic dependence. That's not part of the initial condition. That piece here is what was here in this rotation already. And so the only thing that I'm missing is the C gamma. So I'm sure cutting a bit because the bubble is trivial. The non-trivial piece is the box, the third master, where I don't know the initial condition. It, I, the best I can say is that this is an expansion in epsilon. That's all I can say. Okay. And I, so I write down an expansion in epsilon up to third order in epsilon because that's up to where I've solved my differential equations. So I can take my general solution, my matrix solution, and I can project it on this vector. That gives a horrible mess. So, and I just look at the last component, which is the box. Okay. So that gives a horrible mess. So. There's some choice for C0, C1, C2, C3, such that I get the box integral. So how can I find them? Well, remember that we said the box integral shouldn't have a branch point at u equals zero because it's a planar diagram. It has only discontinuities and cuts for the S channel and the T channel, but not for u equals zero. There's no cut. But u, well, remember that u is actually minus s minus t, which is minus s times one plus x. So actually u equals zero corresponds to x equals minus one. So in other words, my function, my box function as a function of x should not have a discontinuity at x equals minus one. But you can easily see that there are plenty of logs of one plus x in here. So clearly the general solution that I obtained that depends on C0, C1, C2, C3 will have discontinuities at x associated to x equals minus one. There are branch cuts starting at x equals minus one. So the initial condition will correspond to re uh, requiring that uh, there is no discontinuity as you cross the point x equals minus one. 
Now, x negative, well, you first have to go to, well, you have to analytically continue because you get to see when x is negative, you have these logs of x. So you have to make sense out of the logs for negative x. For example, you can say that corresponds to T being negative while S is positive, for example. And well, we can discuss that in the office hours if you like. It, the correct procedure would be when X is negative, corresponding to when S is positive, X is negative, corresponds to log X being log of minus X. Log of minus X is positive if X is negative, plus I pi. We can go through that in the office hours if you like if you um, don't remember how to do the analytic continuation in the model sum invariance. So that's the first thing I do. I just say, okay, now X is negative. So log, well, let's say X is negative and uh, but greater than minus one. So log X must be log minus X plus I pi. And now I check what happens when I get close to X equals minus one. If I get close to x equals minus one, well, nothing should happen there. The function should not have a branch cut starting at x equals minus one. So if I go close to x equals minus one, there should be no log showing up, no logarithmic divergence. So I ask Mathematica, give me the series expansion of x so close to minus one, and I just need a leading order term. Assuming that X lies between zero and minus one, I want X to be greater than minus one. And I get a horrible mess. So let's look at it order by order. Let's look at the first term. Well, okay. Yes, I cannot do much with that. Let's look at the next term. So that's what I get. This is what I get for the coefficient in epsilon. And what you see is there is this log one plus X in the general solution. So when X goes, becomes close to minus one, the general solution has this logarithmic behavior. In particular, that means that if X crosses minus one, there's a branch cut, unless C zero is equal to four. But we know that my, my Feynman integral has no branch cut at, um, x equals minus one. So C zero equals four is uh, the value that gives me the one loop box. Now you continue like this. So now you go to the second term in epsilon, where well, I inject what I found already, C zero is four. And I get this. Well, now I see there's a logarithmic branch cut unless C one is equal to zero. So I put C1 equal to zero. I go to epsilon to the third power and I see that there's a logarithmic branch cut unless C2 is equal to minus four pi square over three. So I can plug that in. And you see, I could keep going like that. So I always need here in this case, but it's specific to this case, I need to, the general solution one over i and epsilon to fix my initial condition. And I didn't need to know the value of the function at any point. It was enough to know the analytic structure coming from physics. The fact that there's no branch cut, uh, no cut associated to U channel. And now I can put it all together. So I take the general solution, I put, project it onto my vector of initial conditions and I plug in the initial conditions that I found, at least for, I found the first up to order epsilon square and that is the answer that you get. So this is a bubble. This is the same, except that X equal, is equal to one. You can check that. that is because one is the bubble in the S channel. The other one is the bubble in the T channel and I put S equal to one. That is why there's a log absent here. And this is the value of the massless box. The first three terms in epsilon, which is enough say for four dimensions all the terms that I neglect here are higher order in epsilon. You may ask, why do you have now a pole all of a sudden here in epsilon? The pole was actually there before 
it was hidden here, in this rotation. We'll see that probably next week. Why, well, what is the, this order parameter epsilon? What does it count? So why did I put one of epsilon square there? So how does the counting go? We'll see that next week. For now, this matrix, you, it falls a bit from the sky or you could use one of the codes, Libra, Fuchsia, Canonica to obtain it. So, so for now, let's say this rotation comes as a black box. Okay, good. I think my time is up. So I think this is the right place to stop. So if you have urgent questions, you can ask them now. Otherwise I propose that we can discuss more during the office hours in the afternoon. Are there any more questions? Piotr? Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, for example, for integrals that uh, that have all three of those singularities, can we uh, somehow use um, this method of discontinuities instead of just fixing the? Can, can you speak up a little bit? I can not hear you very well. Sorry. Um, so, so the question is the following: uh, If I have an integral which has all physical discontinuous all three of them in, in, in this case so also in the u channel yeah. can i use somehow those arguments with the discontinuity yeah well if if you are in a case where all the singularities are there then no you can't use that argument then then you can always fall back to evaluating somehow the function at a specific point Okay. okay, which which can again, as I said, this can be very complicated, but that is always a way to fix your initial condition. If I had managed to give you the value of the box integral at x equals zero or at x equals one, you would have been able to fix the initial condition from that. I see. Thank you. Any more questions? Wait a minute for people to uh, reflect. Let's uh, unmute ourselves and give Claude a round of applause. <laughs>